Live from the campus of MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and the Information Quality Symposium. Now, here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Paul Gillen. We're back, Paul Gillen here with George Gilbert at the MIT CDO IQ Symposium. This is theCUBE, our traveling video platform, and we are winding down our two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage here uh, at MIT <coughs> with uh, Steve Todd, <coughs> excuse me, uh, who is the uh, VP uh, EMC Fellow, Vice President of Strategy and Innovation at EMC. And joining him is Doug Laney of uh, Gartner, who heads up the, uh, I believe, heads up the big data practice at Gartner? Or? Not heading, but okay. part of our new Chief Data Officer research. But you're a key, you're a key guy there. And, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and Doug is a specialist in infonomics, which uh, I'd like you to explain, what is it? Yeah, so infonomics is, a, is an idea we came up with, I don't know, almost 15 years ago. The idea that information actually behaves increasingly as a as an asset itself, as a as a business asset, and that it's increasingly incumbent upon organizations to manage it, to monetize it, to measure it with the same kind of discipline as, as other assets, even though it's not a balance sheet asset. Do you, is this a, a sell job you have to do? I mean, do you have, to, <laughs> yeah. do you have to, to convince organizations that this is true? Well, at, at some level, everybody you know gives lip service to the idea that information is an asset, right? You, you hardly ever come across an executive, right, See, who, who doesn't you know say information is an asset. But then when it comes down to it, do they actually treat it with the same discipline, the same principles, the same practices as their physical or financial assets or their human capital? Not at all. But their systems aren't designed to capture it and track it and measure it. Correct. That, you know, that, that's part of the problem, but I think it's more procedural and, and a, a bit attitudinal as well. Okay. So. One thing, we've been talking a lot about the role of the CDO mm -hmm. here and a year ago, and, and the discussion has changed quite a lot. Last year we were talking mm -hmm. about the CDO versus the CIO and the clash of the titans. That didn't happen. Uh, what we're hearing now is that the CDO is maybe much more of a relationship manager than, than a technology manager. That the, the task of getting the information out of the organization creating the relationships, twisting the arms to get data is really job one for the CDO. Would you say you're seeing that? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of it is bridging that gap between information, and, between IT and, and the business. They just don't communicate, they don't collaborate particularly well, and um, more and more we'll see that as the, as the CDO's kind of primary job. Um, part of it is a language. There's a language gap between the language that IT speaks and the language that business speaks. And CDOs are increasingly you know, concerned with um, creating a, a vernacular that can be, be used to bridge that gap. Uh, Steve, you work with a lot of CIOs, I'm sure. Do they see this as a problem? They do, and, and one of the reasons is they, they see their business model mm -hmm. shifting where the companies that are traditionally just selling products mm -hmm. are realizing that in order to grow their revenues, they have to make money off of data and they don't have uh, uh, approaches, uh, business processes, roles, and most importantly, algorithms to attach value metadata to their content. So we see the CIOs increasingly looking to CDOs and saying, help me assess the value of the data. I'll try and put the uh, IT infrastructures in place, but what are the business processes I need to plug into? Are there any formulas or rules of thumb that are emerging in terms of how to associate data as value with products or services. In other words, you know, we hear from GE, it's we can save X percent on, you know, fuel consumption or energy or energy consumption or increase uptime. Are there are there any of these rules of thumb that are emerging that you know we see widely? Well, it's interesting that you ask because in a year and a half of doing uh, research with uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center, Dr. Jim Short, who's kind of an expert in the data valuation area, as we've talked to people, they're hunger. They're hungry for equations and they're hungry for uh, you know some hard approaches. And that's when we, we we intersected with the infonomics approach, which actually is uh, equations that. Uh, may be right or may be wrong, but they're useful. Uh, and, and perhaps you know, Doug can explain what some of well, these equations maybe, are. Doug, you can give us some examples. <laughs> I mean, yeah. How sure. do you give us some examples well, about over data? Over the years, we've, we've worked with our clients and, and valuation experts and, and economists and some accountants to derive some, some formulas, some models that are useful in different contexts. Now, there are different reasons why you might want to measure information's value. You might want to just kind of prove or justify some a kind of IT 
or information management related initiative. On one side, on the other side, you might want to justify a business initiative through the act actual deployment of information and the, the economic value that it generates. So we've come up with uh, several different models. Some of them are more what we consider to be foundational, non-financial in nature, uh, uh, aggregates of data quality characteristics, um, indices of business relevance, um, measures of impact on key performance indicators. And then on the financial side, we've really just borrowed from the way that valuation experts value any kind of asset using the cost approach, the market approach, and the income approach. But we've tweaked the models a little bit for some of the nuances of, of data. I was going to say, can, mm -hmm. can you drill down a little bit <laughs> into that cost financial yeah, sure. different approaches. Sure. So, Give us so valuation meat. experts will tell you that, that for any kind of intangible asset, and, and arguably information meets not only the criteria of an asset, it's exchangeable for cash, it generates probable future economic benefit, and it's owned ostensibly by an, by an organization. Those are really the, the three criteria for a, an asset. But it also meets the criteria of an intangible asset, and valuation experts say that for any intangible asset, you should initially value it at its cost whatever it costs you to generate or produce or acquire that asset. So that's a fairly easy calculation for information. Um, but then you start to think about how are you going to use that data, and then you get into either the market approach, if you're going to productize it or, or sell it, or the income approach, if you're going to um, uh, uh, attribute um, top or bottom line financial gains to the information itself. When you get into uh the question of how to monetize mm -hmm. data. I can monetize it by selling it, but I can also right. monetize it by giving it away and thereby improving customer yeah, loyalty, yeah. Uh, upsell, cross-sell mm -hmm. potential. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the, how do you figure that in, yeah. in, in, in making that decision? Or you can even use it internally and monetize it that, that way as well. You can, again, attribute some top or bottom line financial gains, some process uh, improvements, some relationship improvements. Um, Sometimes it's difficult to measure, but some people are a bit doctrinaire about what monetization means, and they say, well, data monetization only means selling data. I think that's kind of a limited perspective in that uh, we advise our clients to think a little more broadly about it, because you suggested that monetization means everything from licensing data. Remember, we don't sell data because that would imply the transfer of ownership. You're actually licensing it. Um, all the way down to some indirect methods um, uh, including you know, maybe bartering or exchanging the uh, information, or uh, again, using it to improve uh, business processes in some economically measurable way. So we argue that you're monetizing information if you can measure the economic benefits of it in some, in some way. It, it, are there accounting implications to this? I mean, <laughs> do you know of any companies that carry yeah. data on their balance sheet? No, in, in fact, you're, in the U.S., you're not allowed to. According to international financial standards, you're not allowed to anymore. Well, um, now, hold on. Now, yeah. isn't a company like a credit reporting agency? I mean, that's all they have you would is think data. So. You would think that it was on the balance sheet, and it's not. So they can they can carry a chair as an asset, but not a database. Correct. <laughs> that's a great it, example. And here we are in the midst of the information age, and yet the thing that gives it that, that moniker and that is carried by so many, not only information product companies, but is the source of value for just regular old companies is something that you, you're not allowed to put on the balance sheet according to financial standards. Now there's a working group um, at FASB now that's talking about it, but we're still probably years away yeah. from, Things from anything slowly formal. Things change at FASB, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. But what it creates is a, both a problem in uh, measuring the volatility of, of companies, but also in um, companies not being as transparent as they probably could be or should be with with the, the, the marketplace. So it, I think we heard on an earlier mm -hmm. segment that um, IP in the form of patents can be represented as an asset, yep. and yep. they can, um, I guess you can <clears throat> amortize them mm -hmm. if you acquire them. Right. But Copyrights, trademarks. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then other forms of information that don't, or data that don't fall into those categories can't. Correct. And, and yet 80% of the executives that we survey believe that the value of their information is represented on their balance sheets. So there's, a, there's an extreme level of executive ignorance about the realities of, of information as an asset. Again, wow. they're all giving it lip service, but um, it's not something that is, is really measured in, in any way. And so we're trying to help uh, give our clients uh, uh, some tools to do that. Uh, the, uh, our keynote speaker this mm -hmm. morning, whose name is suddenly Tom Davenport, Tom Davenport right. 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 had a great um, mm -hmm. 
quote, he said that when, when clients come to him and say, my, you know, my, my, help me, what do I do? My executives don't get the value of data and analytics. Right. What should I do? He says, I tell them to resign. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, in fact, do you see uh, many companies that don't appreciate the value of data and analytics anymore? Um, well, probably. They, I, I would argue that there are very few organizations that completely value data and analytics. Uh, I don't know what you think, but we need to you yeah. talk well, as well. Yeah, well, the, the ones that I'm talking about, uh, to are mm -hmm. focused less on the models that, that Doug mm -hmm. just mentioned about economic and, and assigning a dollar value, and they're more interested use in assigning cases. use cases yeah. and also uh, these metrics that Doug talked about, mm -hmm. such as are you keeping track of data quality for a given data set? Mm -hmm. Are you keeping track of how much that data set is relevant to different lines of businesses. Mm -hmm. So as we've been exposed to the Gartner research, we mm -hmm. at EMC have, have begun to create a metadata repository alongside of our data lake and expose mm -hmm. some of those key metrics. Mm -hmm. And what that'll allow us to do is to be able to score different data sets in our data lake and start to understand, well, why is this data set more important than another or a higher priority and should we treat it differently and maybe we could monetize it. So this is um, along the lines of, I've got a, a metadata catalog um, that has like a business glossary, so terminology that's sort of English language, mm -hmm. and it's got sort of information as to what data gets used most, and I can use that as a proxy for the data value. It doesn't show up on my you know, financial statements, right. but there's implicit you know, ranking and scoring and yeah. valuation going yep. on. And we're learning uh, how to manage it and measure it, which is a key part of understanding the value. We just can't report it. Right, but that's a good proxy. If you're trying to prioritize, as, as most organizations are trying to prioritize data governance um, initiatives, which data to focus on, on governing, that kind of measure is a, is a great proxy. It's not a financial measure, but it's, it's a great um, indicator of where you should be prioritizing. What if you were to, um, what if you were in the business of selling, um, uh, just to pick an example, the high frequency you know, trading algorithms. Mm -hmm. you know, not that you would sell <clears throat> the same to everyone, but they would take kernels you know, and either assemble them or they would add their own secret sauce. Of the, the algorithms themselves? Yeah, you, you sell the you know, kernel of, right. you go back you know, 50, 100 years mm -hmm. and um, you have a couple different perspectives. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, they can't run the same models as everyone else, but they can build on yours. Right. Or they can feed different information yeah. into them. Yeah. Right. Yes. So how would that get accounted for? Well, uh, algorithms are a different animal altogether. Algorithms are effectively a business process, and business processes can be patented. Okay. So you see all, all the time algorithms being, being patented. Um, so that's different than the data that actually feeds them. So an algorithm devoid of the data is something that is a, is a, a formal type of, of IP. So we're just, it's just an anachronism, essentially, that we don't have a uh, similar accounting um, yeah. rules for, yeah. for right. data. Now what's going to be interesting is as machine learning takes hold, the algorithms that are generated by machine learning can't be described, right? Because they they're, have to they're have neural data. networks and so, so forth. Yeah. And um, so they're going to be more difficult to patent. The, are there a particular industries that you work with, uh, uh, Doug, that, that you think are, are further ahead of the curve in understanding the value of data as an asset? And conversely, are there industries that just don't get it, don't get it at all? Probably those that monetize it, I would say. The retail industry, telcos, are pretty sharp about the value of, of the data that they collect. Um, there are several retailers that uh, directly sell their, their data to their CPG uh, partners and in that way they're actually able to capture the market value of that, that data. Telcos do much the same thing, but they do it very quietly because um, we're all very sensitive to having our... Regulation. Yeah, yeah. And, having, and having said right. that, one, one interesting thing about that is even the companies that are, are selling data mm -hmm. sets, when you go to negotiate a price, mm -hmm. there's no formulas or there's no standards. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're finding that the, the price is negotiated based on what you paid for the last data set mm -hmm. that you bought from the vendor right. and what was in it and how big it was. 
and then you just barter from there and you dicker from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a real need for uh, formal methods and standardization yeah, yeah. to negotiate for data sets, That's and I think you'll see them emerging. Another Sounds, topic we can yeah. get into, but we are out of time. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Doug Laney thank you, from gentlemen. Gardner, Steve Todd from EMC. Fascinating discussion, and we can go on and on, but. This is the uh, end of this segment. This is theCUBE. We will be back with uh, our next guest in just a minute. Stay tuned. Thank you.